This project is a continuation by other means of the question that this group has researched for several years. What are the politics of psychoanalysis? Eli Zaretsky, in his Political Freud, argues that psychoanalysis represented an inward turn, where self-reflection was allied to radicalism and change. This self-reflection would uncover new and surprising blockages toward the realization of humanistic aims. He writes that, quote, The analytic attitude represented a great advance in moral thought, because it extended self-reflection from acts to thoughts and wishes. Where liberals saw progress as blocked by external anti-liberal forces, democratic leftists saw progress as blocked by forces that were internal to their own societies, such as class exploitation and ideological mystification. In the same way, Freud saw the resistances to rationality and progress as internal to consciousness and the ego, and not as external obstacles such as lack of education or ignorance. What distinguished political Freudianism, then, was the effort to identify the obstacles to progress from within the movement toward progress itself. African American Freudians showed that slavery and ethnocidal violence were internal to liberalism and even to the black freedom movement itself, not marginal or contingent. Feminist Freudians showed that misogyny was internal to the family and to women themselves. Anti-war Freudians showed that violence was internal to mass democracies and the modern nation state. An important substream of the 20th century radical tradition, then, involved collective processes of self-reflection beyond what either communists or mainstream liberals sought to accomplish." End quote. Zaretsky is rescuing an unpopular notion in a time of relational repair and mindfulness. The value, for oneself and for the possibility of something better, of unmitigated and intensive self-reflection. Yet, might Zaretsky's historical resuscitation domesticate explosive forces that emerge when self-reflection is ruthlessly pursued? Just as much as radical psychoanalysis called for an inward turn, others in that tradition latched onto the hope of a different relation to the outside. Zaretsky registers this moment of psychoanalytic politics as the antinomian current, which he finds in Norman O. Brown and Herbert Marcuse. The politics of psychoanalysis, according to O'Brown, is betrayed by reflective inwardness. Psychoanalysis opens access to the experience of body, sense, and communication merged in the primary processes that cannot be bottled back up in the structures of rationality correlated with the ego. Zaretsky historicizes this heretical strand of the politics of psychoanalysis in the context of the American cultural radic radicalism of the 1960s, coupled with the long wave rhythms of American religious history. But our sense is that this side or slope of the politics of psychoanalysis goes much deeper and spreads wider. It is a style of psychoanalytic politics that traces roots in figures prior to Freud, like Nietzsche and Schopenhauer, is articulated alongside and oftentimes indistinguishably with mainstream Freudo Marxism, as in the case of Wilhelm Reich, and continues to flourish in the French appropriation of psychoanalysis from surrealism to the critical philosophies of the 60s and 70s. We ask, why do these two slopes of psychoanalytic politics, the inner and the outer, so to speak, the one focused on clearing the blockage of irrationality and the other on the dissemination of a new libidinal aesthetic and world relation, continually reassert themselves at different moments in the history of the politics of psychoanalysis, insisting in different voices in different guises? We see something like an antinomy at work between these two politics of psychoanalysis. The first politics, a reflective approach to the unconscious, a heightened sensitivity to the depths of motivation, a rationality empowered by an encounter with unreason, an autonomy redoubled for its fragility, a tortured continuity with the subject of liberalism, of German idealism, and of socialism. The second politics, the rejection of values associated with consciousness, a search for a transformed sensorium and new transcendental aesthetic, a view of the human as taken up in the force of a drive that exceeds it, affirmatively abandoned to natural history, an ethic of impersonality and immersion in an unconscious, a critique of form and representation by violent energetics, a new writing to counter-desexualized cognition and language. 
Of course, each side rejects the other. The blockage side accuses the other of a mysticism that complements reification. The mystics see themselves as transcending the cons constitutive divisions of an unfree society, but wind up as a comforting veil. Quote, there is tenderness only in the coarsest demand, that no one shall go hungry anymore, end quote. The prophets and analysts of the libidinal body accuse the blockage side of, an, of incomplete revolution, a lingering pious respect for consciousness and reason, precisely those entities that were revealed by psychoanalytic thought as restrictive. These radicals betray a fear of risk and contingency. Our contribution presents these two sides with an aim to getting perspective into their imbrication and thereby asking, what are the politics of psychoanalysis for the present? The original sense is nonsense, and common sense is a cover-up job, repression. Psychoanalysis, symbolic consciousness, leads from disguised to patent nonsense. Wittgenstein, surrealism, Finnegan's Wake. From the start, the pursuit of subjectivity in Western Marxism was couched in the negative. It was directed toward fathoming why subjectivity did not show, why the great chance was lost, why and bourgeois society kept grinding on. It sought to explain, as it were, why there was no subjectivity and, at the same time, to awaken the subject to thought and action. The revolutionary idea in psychoanalysis is the idea of the body as a political organization, a body politic, as a historical variable, as plastic, polymorphous perversity, the translation of all our sense into one another, the interplay between the senses the metaphor, the free translation, the separation of the senses, their mutual isolation, is sexual organization, is bondage to the tyranny of one partial impulse, leading to the absolute and exclusive concentration of the life of the body in the representative person. Since the market economy was shattered and patched up provisionally until the next crisis, its laws do not suffice for its explanation, other than its psychology, in which the objective compulsion is continually and newly internalized. It is not understandable either why men passively adjust to a condition of unchanged, destructive rationality, or why they enroll in movements whose contradiction to their own interests is in no way difficult to perceive. In prostitution, one goes from intensity to order. In adultery, from order to intensity. But it is the same route, immobile dissimulation, the voyage on the spot which crosses the extremes of pulsional stupidity and notional clarity. This is the same indiscernibility of signs which removes from us, we libidinal economists, all appetite for vulgar romanticism and for equally tedious formalism, for a politics of spontaneous passions and just as much for a politics of understanding. We work at a refinement of dissimulation. Structure is stupid and pathos sterile. We must also consider the mass psychological basis of world wars and ask ourselves, what produced the mass psychological soil on which imperialistic ideology could grow and be put into practice? Fear of the consequences of refusal to take up arms could be the motive for going to war only in a small minority. During the war, 
there was a conscious rejection on the part of a minority, a peculiar submission to fate or an indolence, and violent enthusiasm, not only in the middle classes, but also in masses of industrial workers. The indolence of many, as well as the enthusiasm of many others, was undoubtedly basic in the mass psychology of the war. Desire is present wherever something flows and runs, carrying along with it interested subjects, but also drunken or slumbering subjects toward lethal destinations. The inhibition of rebellion is unconscious. Psychoanalysis must undo the codes so as to attain the quantitative and qual qualitative flows of libido that traverse dreams, fantasies, and pathological formulations, as well as myth, tragedy, and the social formations. Psychoanalytic interpretation does not consist in competing with codes, adding a code to the codes already recognized, but in decoding in an absolute way in eliciting something that is uncodable by virtue of its polymorphism and its polyvocity. The specificity of myth, understood objectively, must pale under the rays of the subjective libido. It is indeed the world of representation that crumbles, or tends to crumble. Nobody could have foreseen this divergence between socioeconomic progress and structural regression. To give up boundaries is to give up the reality principle. The reality principle, the light by which psychoanalysis has set its course, is a false boundary drawn between inside and outside, subject and object, real and imaginary, physical and mental. It gives us the divided world, the two principles of mental function in which psychoanalysis is stuck. Really, to go beyond Freud means to go beyond the re reality principle. And really, to go beyond the pleasure principle is to go beyond the reality principle. For Freud himself showed that these two are one. In this way, the authoritarian state develops its enormous interest in the authoritarian family. The family is the factor, is the factory of its structure and ideology. Suppression of the natural sexuality in the child makes the child apprehensive, shy, obedient, afraid of authority, good, and adjusted in the authoritarian sense. It paralyzes the rebellious forces because any rebellion is laden with anxiety. It produces, by inhibiting sexual curiosity and sexual thinking in the child, a general inhibition of thinking and of critical faculties. In brief, the goal of sexual suppression is that of producing an individual who is adjusted to the authoritarian order and who will submit to it in spite of all misery and degradation. The result of this process is the fear of freedom. The essence or nature of desire no longer in relation to objects, aims, or even sources, but as an abstract subjective essence, libido. It is as though Freud were asking to be forgiven his profound discovery of sexuality by saying to us, at least it won't go further than the family. The dirty little secret in place of the wide open spaces glimpsed for a moment. The familialist reduction in place of the drift of desire. In place of the great decoded flows, little streams recoded in mommy's bed. Interiority 
in place of a new relationship with the outside. Exploring the roots of the majority's libidinal ties to the ruling minority, social psychology might discover that this tie is a repetition or continuation of the child's psychic attitude toward his parents, particularly toward his father. We find a mixture of admiration, fear, faith and confidence in the father's strength and wisdom, briefly an affectively conditioned reflection of his intellectual and moral qualities. And we find the same in adults of a patriarchal class society vis-a-vis -vis the members of the ruling class. Related to this are certain moral principles which entice the poor to suffer rather than to do wrong and which lead them to believe that the purpose of their life is to obey their rulers and do their duty. Even these ethical conceptions, which are so important for social stability, are the products of certain affective and emotional relations to those who create and represent such norms. Every person, then, is many persons, a multitude made into one person, a corporate body incorporated a corporation, a corporation soul, every man a parson person. The unity of the person is as real or as unreal as the unity of corporation. That anyone wants to satisfy his biological needs is indeed a psychological fact that needs no further probing. It is self-evident. In such social circumstances, the problem can then only be, why don't more men steal? The influence of education, of ideology, have changed the structure of the drives in these men in a way which turns the energies withdrawn from the impulses in question against these very impulses and hampers their further development. The postural model of the body consists of lines of energy, psychic streams, Freud's libidinal cathexes, which are, like electricity, action at a distance, flux, influx, reflux, connecting different erogenous points in the body, the psychosexual organizations, and connecting one body with other bodies. A magnetic field of action at a distance or a magical field. Magic action is an inaction which influences the body image irrespective of the actual distance in space. In magic action, there is space connection between the most distant things. For head with foot hath private amity and both with moons and tides. Everything without exception, which today bears the name of morality and ethics, serves the oppressors of working humanity. The truth is that sexuality is everywhere. The way a bureaucrat fondles his records, a judge administers justice. A businessman causes money to circulate. The way the bourgeoisie fucks the proletariat and so on, and there is no need to resort to metaphors any more than for the libido to go by way of metamorphoses. Hitler got fascists sexually aroused. Flags, nations, armies, banks get a lot of people aroused. To sum it up briefly, the difference between revolutionary and bourgeois politics is that the former sets out the sense of the needs of the masses, whereas the latter is wholly founded on the structural, historically conditioned inability of the masses to formulate their needs. The representational chamber is an energetic setup. Describe it and follow its functioning. That's something to do. 
No need to perform the critique of metaphysics or a p political economy, which is the same thing, since it critiques since critique assumes and endlessly recreates this very theatricality. Rather be inside and forget it. That's the position of the death drive. The few people who are in favor of autonomy must work energetically to make education an education for contradiction and resistance. I could envision one attending commercial films in high school, but in the grammar schools too, and quite simply showing to the students what a fraud they are, how full of lies, or reading a magazine with them and showing them how they are being taken for a ride by an exploitation of their own instinctual needs. Thus, one simply tries, first of all, to arouse the awareness that men and women are constantly being deceived. The drive, is, the drive is a movement that comes from elsewhere, from the non-individuated, the buried, dispersed, proliferating, confused, archaic nature of our provenance. It makes us into a thrusted being, not a being produced by a network of causes, but dragged along, launched, projected, or even thrown. This elsewhere is not, however, a beyond. It is not a transcendence. This elsewhere is in us. It forms within us the most originary and the most energetic motor of the impetus that we are. It is being as the verb to be. Motion, movement, emotion, shaking. Rising up of desire and of fear. Awaiting and attempt. Essay, outbreak crisis and exaltation, exasperation and exhaustion, formation of forms, invention of signs, uncontrollable tension up to the unbearable where it breaks or rather settles out. The masses <clears throat> are not identical with the people on whose sovereign rationality the free society was to be established. Today, the chance of freedom depends to a great extent on the power and willingness to oppose mass opinion, to assert unpopular policies, to alter the direction of progress. Psychoanalysis cannot offer political alternatives, but it can contribute to the restoration of private autonomy and rationality. The politics of mass society begin at home with the shrinking of the ego and its subjection to the collective ideal. Counteracting this trend may also begin at home. Psychoanalysis may help the patient to live with a conscience of his own and with his own ego ideal, which may well mean to live in refusal and opposition to the establishment. Freedom is fire, overcoming this world by reducing it to a fluctuating chaos, as in schizophrenia. The chaos which is the eternal ground of creation. There is no universe, there is no one way. We are always in error, lost in the wood, standing in chaos, the original mess, creating a brand new world. Thank God the world cannot be made safe for democracy or anything else. Are we in a strategic or utopian moment? That is to say, do we ask for psychoanalysis to orient us toward internal blockages so that political organizing might better overcome stumbling blocks? Or do we look to psychoanalysis to help us exercise a badly underused sense, the sense of possibility? This is again to put the distinction too broadly, as Reich, Finical, Marcuse, Adorno, etc. were utopians, and Brown, Deleuze and Guattari, etc. were connected to the political movements of their day. But the antinomy seems real enough. 
It is not possible to resolve these tensions without doing damage to the material and to our hopes. Our social form produces separations whose relative merits easily sway us to become one-sided champions. We have tried to shape rather than resolve this tension and leave off the presentation with questions.